Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Fun and Games Podcast. I'm Jeff Monin. And I'm Matt A.K. Stormageddon. And you're listening to episode 113. And this episode, Matt and I wanted to talk a little bit about, I guess the idea would be the, well, with a lot of remasters that have come out and remakes and collections and everything else, there's a lot of changes that can happen. There's differences of experiences. And so I guess we wanted to talk a bit about the concept of the true vision of of a game. Yeah, we've touched on remasters and remakes before, and I'm sure we will again as more continue to come out every year. It's a continual thing. But this specific idea of when you're going and re-releasing older games, for example, as of when we're recording this, they very much recently re-released three of the greatest Castlevania games, as far as I'm concerned, for the ones from the Game Boy Advance, on a collection. And, you know, when those come out as a collection, typically there aren't many improvements made. It's for the most part, like, here's a port of these things. Like, they have to make some minor changes to work with the new platform. But beyond that, it's more or less the same thing. But if there are bugs or tiny hiccups, typically they'll take them out. Well, is that the correct thing to do? Because those original issues were probably hiccups that were by design from the limitations of what the console could do at the time. Should they take those out or should they leave them in? You know, when you change voice actors in games and things like that, should you change that over the years, things like that. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that this is something that we've kind of chipped away at here and there on this show is the idea of what medium is video games like as far as a media that people consume and criticize and talk about and archive and what have you. And something that was pointed out to me recently through a YouTube video, I think that I was watching is the idea that a lot of people will compare games to movies, but in a lot of ways they are, but not as viewers, but as directors, or as actors within it. And we are, when the game is released to us, we are getting to produce that movie because, you know, recording a playthrough, that's watching a movie. Yeah. And we do that all the time now. We, we watch Twitch streamers. I mean, we both Twitch stream. People are watching our movie version of this. And in that same way that some movies use practical effects or have weird outtakes or little things that they utilize that aren't necessarily planned but become part of the fabric of that work, so too do the games. And there's a lot of ways that they go about that. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, I mean, as long as Jeff and I have been playing games, there have been anthologies. As early as the Super Nintendo, there was the Super Mario All-Star collection that was on the Super Nintendo, which had... The original, original version had Mario 1, Lost Levels, Mario 2, and Mario 3. And then they released a different version that ended up having Super Mario World as well, like a special edition. Yeah. All of those games, except for Super Mario World, which was just a port of Super Mario World on the same cartridge, these were new games. Like, they remade none of the screen tearing, none of the, you know, weird graphical glitches, flashing sprites. None of that came over. They remade these games from the ground up with the graphics that they designed specifically for this Super Nintendo game. All the graphics were universal across. Luigi usually looks the same as Mario in all games except two. And then going on, he would slowly get his own character and world and like look a little different. He was no longer a palette swap. But in this version, Luigi had not only his look, but his jump style with his feet flailing in all the games. He didn't have the higher jump like in two, but he had the style and design. Some people would argue that's not that's not my Luigi, you know? And for some people it is though. A very funny thing that happened to me and my spouse is we typically celebrate our anniversaries by picking a game and playing it. Mm -hmm. And one of our early ones, I had Super Mario Brothers 3 from the Nintendo Virtual Console on my Wii. And that has the benefit of save states. We're like, oh man, we're gonna like, we'll do one player, we'll pass the controller, we're gonna be every level whenever we need to like stop and come back later. Yeah, it took us the better part of a week over time to do it, but we beat it. And Sarah just kept being like, something's wrong with the game. What do you mean? It just, something's not right about it. I'm like, I don't know, like it's emulator, I guess. It, it feels more or less the same. I guess. I mean, I know where everything is. I played this game, but this this isn't, I don't know this game, but I know this game because Sarah didn't have an NES growing up. She had an SNES. And so she played all, she played Super Mario All-Stars. That's how she got introduced to the Mario series. And she had barely 
clocked yeah. the the look of the NES games. And so when we played through it, it took for both of us an embarrassing amount of time to realize this was what was going on. But in the same way that for, say, you or I, Matt, who grew up with the NES and then were like, okay, there's new versions, whatever, for her... That was her Luigi. That was her version of it. And the same goes for any sort of re-release that happens. And so the notion of who's, who's truth of these games is, is hilariously nebulous. Correct. And like on the far end, opposite end of the spectrum, we just got Super Mario 3D All-Stars within the last year, which most people complained they didn't do enough with. The fact that they bear, they made them playable on the Switch, but beyond that, like they didn't make any improvements to the control. They didn't adjust any of the button mapping. They didn't add any special features. And Super Mario 64 is one of my favorite Mario games. I've done a side quest on it. Like it's one of those things that kind of destroyed my brain as far as what was possible in gaming. But going back and playing it now, I still deeply love it. But I could see someone who has no context for this game playing that game and going, this is terrible. Why can I only pivot the camera in hard directions? Like, why can't I just use the second analog stick? Like something as simple as just removing the C buttons and mapping what the C buttons do to the analog stick, which they did. The second analog stick, you can slap in a direction like it's a C button, Mm -hmm. but like just give the player camera control. The basics are there. The coding, I can't imagine would have been that hard, but these are just direct ports. But other people might argue, well, I want that pure experience. I want it to feel like it did on the N64, even though it's not on the N64 anymore. And it's true. And N64 is definitely an error. uh, I've gone on record with the fact that I didn't grow up with an N64. I grew up with a PlayStation. And so I have my horde of games that I love that I'm not going to force anybody to play fresh now because the same way it Super Mario 64 in its original state is very much a classic with asterisks to it yeah. where it's just you got to understand what was going on at the time you got to you got to know what a big deal this was and that is still important and that doesn't mean we should completely do away with the original version of it but it does mean if we want to make these collections palatable Mm -hmm. there are yeah there are certain things that design has moved forward enough philosophy has moved forward as far as games that we can't go back and we shouldn't go back just because a game is old doesn't mean it's going to be clunky and just because a game is new doesn't mean it's going to be slick but there's plenty of instances of that and i'm sure it's been a little while since i've played the game boy advance castlevania games and I'm sure Aria of Sorrow is still going to hold up as one of the best goddamn games ever. <laughs> um, and look, once they release a DS collection, I, I will say they've, they'll have they have everything great about Castlevania on, on modern consoles. Yeah. But, but until then, going back to Circle of the Moon, it's a little rough. It is, yeah. And like I had to get back into it. I mean, going back to Symphony of the Night, it's a little rough. It's it is. Not, it's not bad by any means, but like... Considering I've played a lot of modern Metroidvania games that have added stuff to the genre, not immensely. I feel like the genre hasn't super evolved in a way that a lot of other genres have. Mm-hmm. But they've added some shorthand that is just not there in Castlevania. Something that I, a game I love. And, like, I died a lot trying to replay it on the PS4. Also, the sprite work is gorgeous. But, like, to scale, it's still not easy to see what's going on in the same level it was back in the day. We're just working with different dimensions. And they've done everything they can to improve everything. But, like, I I don't know if I've said this on the show, but anyone who knows me on social media knows I've been looking for a Game Boy Advance SP for ages. One of the consoles I regret getting, uh, getting rid of, rather. Jeff helped me find one. And I've been playing one recently with the help of the EverDrive and playing some older games and looking at them and going, these still look gorgeous on these small screens. But I was looking at the backlight, and I'm like, I thought the backlight was brighter. And then I forgot that there were generations of backlight on the SP. There were also generations of games on the SP. I think that, and this is a topic for a separate conversation, I think the N64 PlayStation generation are some of the poorest aging games in games history because also every game was making games history at the time. Yeah, they were pushing the boundaries as far as polygonal graphics as far as moving in the third dimension there are shifts in shorthand and language of control within that generation i i'm pretty sure we've gone on record on on this podcast of the idea of at the beginning of i mean super mario 64 one of the launch titles for the nintendo 64 it gave you 
four extra buttons to deal with exclusively for cameras. It's not A, B, and then C, one, two, three, four. It's those are the camera buttons. And that's and that's why Super Mario 64 did what it did and to put that forward. And the PlayStation, the PS1 eventually had the DualShock, the, uh, the two joysticks, but for a while there, the shoulder buttons very much were the same thing. Yeah. They eventually became like triggers and other aspects like that. But for a while, certainly older titles within that generation, it was, oh, that's how you control the camera. And boy, was it slow because there's no analog control to it. You're just ho- clicking or holding it. So it only can move so fast. And that limits you in what you can design and what you can do. And I mean, if you want to have a, a a really sad drinking game, look at magazine reviews of 3D games from that era and just t- take a sip. Don't do a shot. Take a sip, babes. Every time they mention the poor camera. <laughs> and you're right. So they don't age all that gracefully, but sometimes it's part of its charm. Sometimes what this also means is they're older games. So yeah. people have spent a long time with them, not even just in their memories. For me, going back to Castlevania Requiem was not tricky at all because I've never stopped playing Castlevania right. Symphony of the Night. Yeah, I'm no speedrunner. I'm no deep expert on it, but I know the game pretty well. I can feel how it moves under yeah. my, in my hands. And when you give that to people who are far more keen on cracking the thing like an Easter egg and just seeing every, you know, like a Kinder egg and seeing what's inside, all sorts of incredible things happen and all sorts of wonderful exploits and tricks and quirks are found, unintentional ideas. Speaking of, one of the things that Matt, you and I were talking about before we started recording that sort of precipitated this topic is the NES game for Sanadu, mm-hmm. which I saw a recent YouTube video, I wish I could remember the channel, about how within the game, in the original NES game for Sanadu, I'm pretty sure I'm saying that correctly, there's an X in there. <laughs> it's one of those sort of, you know, side scrolly adventure, find items, you know, Battle of Olympus, Zelda 2 kind of games. And there's an item called the Pendant that is supposed to increase your damage by 25%. Except they mixed up the programming somewhere and you already have the benefit of the Pendant when you start the game. And when you find it, it returns you to regular damage. It actually makes you weaker, just like the critical ratio of Pokemon Red and Blue. Focus Energy didn't uh, multiply your, your critical hit by four times. It it uh, decreased it by two to 25 percent. It's the same thing. And so there was arguments about, well, do we keep this or do we not? It's a game that has a password system. So you can actually generate a password to be wherever you were in the game and remove the pendant. Mm-hmm. Or do you leave it in there? People look to it as a built in difficulty mod right. because these are games that can't be that that aren't patched. And so you learn to live with them or not, or just forever have these strange mysteries and do we get rid of them? And then to games that do get patched, think of games that have a very active dialogue between the developers and its player base. Games like Team Fortress 2, which is one that I think of off the top of my head that will have strange bugs occur that if they're not game breaking, Sometimes they lean into them. Several, I don't play Team Fortress 2, but I am endlessly fascinated by games of that ilk and the community that comes up within it. And these sorts of moments where, well, this weird, you know, the the very idea of rocket jumping. Team Fortress 2 didn't invent rocket jumping. I can't remember which first person shooter first did it. And I'm sure someone is already yelling at the the podcast right now. So thank you. I can't hear, (laughs) I can't hear you. I can't. But the very idea of splash damage shooting you up into the air. Well, we just keep doing that now. And do we add that into older games? Do we add that into newer games? And this is just getting into gameplay. Well, yeah. I mean, I think what's really interesting about this topic and the idea of purity of games, like it's a slippery slope, right? We talk about the purity of the experience. A lot of folks want difficulty sliders in the Dark Souls games and people are like, that's not true to the original experience. And like, you can argue that some of these bugs, some of these changes, some of these identities are core to the original experience of the game. 
something I was talking about offline that I'm excited to play now. I mentioned my new old Game Boy Advance SP that I have and an EverDrive for it. And I have the fan translated version of Mother 3 on there. Nintendo don't come for me. And please, I can't afford it. They clearly don't care about Mother 3 in America, so just do what you want. Right, exactly. Um, But there's a fan translation of Mother 3 that a lot of folks have played and praised. And there's a version of the ROM that you can put on the EverDrive and play on a Game Boy Advance. And so I'm very excited to get to finally play that because I've played Earthbound, never beat it, though I do love the game and I know how it ends. And then, you know, I never played Earthbound Origins on the Wii U virtual console because I never had a chance. I think it was the Wii U and not the Wii, whichever one I think it was. Yeah, Earthbound Beginnings, I think, was on the Wii U, the NES version. And and, and I've heard that Mother 3 is the best of the games. It's supposed to be very good. And so I'm excited to play that. But some might argue that it's not the true version of the game because technically it's not the official nintendo release has only been in japanese there's been no official nintendo hands on this it was translated by a fan who is knows the language and knows the grammar and wants people to be able to experience it i'm excited to play it and i'm no purist i'm like i'll play this version but on the other hand i'm the same person who complains about pixel smoothing and how the steam versions of chrono trigger are an abomination to chrono triggers everywhere you know i mean yeah (laughs) because You you really haven't read Shakespeare until you've read it in the original Klingon, because the because well, yeah the Mother Three patch gets into the idea of localizations where I will quietly try to dismantle the idea of the video game auteur. It's it's bunk. It's stupid. It is. And as a fan of Metal Gear Solid, I I have. I have been in that punch bowl line, and <laughs> I am I will knock over the Kool Aid. This is fine, but. Even in official channels, the fact that you and I, Matt, are Americans, English-speaking individuals, uh, English is a first language, and I'm presuming you've you've uh, said nothing of the sort that you read or understand Japanese. Not even a little. I'll understand individual words vocalized, but looking at it, I couldn't tell you. Yeah, same. So that means hordes of games that we play and that we have deep memories of even more than the idea of how does Mario look on Super Nintendo versus NES is the fact that we are still getting localized, translated through several filters versions of these games. There isn't that purest experience unless we want to be playing Chrono Trigger in Japanese. Unless you want a lot of Square RPGs of that era are notable for uh, Ted Woolsey's work as a localizer. Mm -hmm. And a lot of lines and characterizations that we take to be inextricable from the characters were things that were thrown in, that were added, that were changed, whether to fill up space, save space, or to match different cultural norms. What seems cute and endearing in Japanese comes off as whiny and obnoxious in America. Just look at character polls of Final Fantasy VIII, uh, (laughs) if, if, if you want to get into that snake pit. But the idea of before Ted Woolsey was doing uh, those localizations, one of the most infamous lines from a Final Fantasy game, you spoony bard from Final Fantasy IV. That is in no way, shape, or form what that original line was. Right. The I believe it was somewhere along the lines of, because the line before Edward uh, said spoony bard was like, you've got it all wrong. And Tella in the Japanese version says something along the lines of, what have I got wrong? And instead of that, they just gave him like a, you lovesick fool. And they just made it funny, you spoony bard. And that Final Fantasy IV has been re-released a lot. So many In varying forms. Perfect pixel sprites, pixel smooth, 3D versions. It's on the Game Boy Advance. It's on the Nintendo DS. It's on the PSP. And they're all completely different versions, even though they're all, those are near each other. It just recently was released as part of the Pixel Remaster Collection. It's Final Fantasy IV is one of the most re-released Final Fantasy games. Mm-hmm. And yet, you Spoonie Bard stays because despite being wrong, being actually technically wrong, it's what people want. Yeah. And... There are other lines and other characterizations that will be more for- forgived, more, okay, maybe that wasn't exactly how I remember, Oh, or that's a fun characterization, let's go with that. The Final Fantasy V advanced version of Gilgamesh is 
particularly infamous for being wonderful. And I, I can agree with that. But there again, it's what is what is the purest version of this? Well, who are you asking and when did they play it? Right. Like for us, we were talking earlier. We're both Symphony of the Night fanatics. We love that game. And we are also Yuri Lowenthal fanatics, as you know, as he's appeared multiple times on the show. And like, I love his version of Alucard, but it's not the original version. And I was thrown off when I played the PS4, PS5 version that's out because I never owned the PSP version, which is what's ported. But I love it. I don't like. But then again, also, it drove me crazy that what the what is a man line is no longer there. And I think that's got nothing to do with the quality of the game or the change. I think it's my connection to it. If I'm someone who's never played Symphony of the Night, then this version is a flawless version. And I wouldn't even say that having these new actors in gives it flaws. I'd just say it's makes it different. It's the same way that you come to expect, like I could never watch Cowboy Bebop in Japanese because to me, Spike Spiegel is Steven Bloom and vice versa. Like that voice actor embodies that character. I'm rewatching it right now with my spouse because she wants to see it for the first time before watching the live action version that's coming out. And like Hulu has both versions, the dub and the sub. And the Japanese actors are phenomenal, don't get me wrong. It's a superlative cast in both Japanese and English. It's just that Stephen Bloom is my spike. And I want Sarah to experience what I experienced because also Cowboy Bebop is the reason I love Steve Bloom. It's why I followed his career as closely as I have. So I think that purist is the wrong term. I think also people who get mad that they take out genuine issues with a game in a remaster seems odd to me. Like... We've talked about Mega Man on the show before. There there have been several Mega Man collections. The one on the GameCube, as I recall, that gen of consoles, Xbox, GameCube, and PS2, they kept in the the pixel warping and like the, you know, flickering sprites and like all of those things that were in the original versions. But I believe on the newest ones on current consoles that are split into two parts for reasons, that stuff is gone. Most of the graphical defects have been removed as far as I can tell. And that's an interesting choice. I don't think it's bad, but like what I identify a lot with Mega Man is the the toes of steel and inching off ledges and sprites clipping and flashing due to too much going on on the screen. Like that was the charm of Mega Man trying to do as much as it did before those consoles could even do that much. That's true. I, I'm pretty sure the, the Digital Foundry versions have maintained the, the toes of steel and, okay. and those sorts of things. I actually, one of the other rabbit holes I've gone down that has gotten me thinking a lot about this topic has been watching some of the game developer conference GDC panels that have been hosted by Frank Cifaldi. And I'm sorry, uh, Digital Eclipse, not Digital Foundry. Digital Eclipse is the company that's behind Mega Man Legacy Collection, SNK 40th Anniversary Arcade Collection, and a number of those that are, as uh, you might be gathering, they're emulation collections. Yeah. But Frank is also part of the video game history uh, collective. And his panels have been all in favor of emulation. And the idea of a game doesn't need to prove itself to be preserved. It should be preserved. And how do we go about doing that? And that emulation is the best, perfect way to do that. And if companies got on board with that, we could be able to get, we could have better collections of games. We could have better preservations and archiving of games. And while we are getting, we have had the virtual console and Nintendo Switch Online, we have had PS1 classics on the PS3 and Vita. These are still curated lists. Yeah, The largest collection of NES games on any non-NES system, I don't know off the top of my head whether that was the Wii or whatever it is, is still a fraction of all of the NES games that came out. And the same way that I know you have N64 games that you would not recommend to anybody ever, but you love them. I have I have PS1 games, NES games that I have Game Gear games, just about any Game Gear game of which I have several and of which I'm very happy to play once my analog pocket arrives. <laughs> uh, I'm so excited. But th- they're not incredible games. They're not games I'm being like, oh my God, you're miss. You haven't played Sonic 2 for the Game Gear? Good. But it's bad. It's <laughs> so bad. It's it's not good. It's not bad. It's just um uh, I don't I don't know. It's 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 kombucha, baby. It's not for everybody. <laughs> but it's far less healthy than kombucha, though. Yes. But that sort of preservation is key. 
And there are things one can do that are, I might call modular, to preserve the original version while also giving access and, and growing accessibility, which is something that, Matt, I know you and I are very keen on uh, accessibility in games and not just uh, easy mode, but how people are able to play the game, access the game, story modes, uh, taking into account people's manual dexterity or tensions. All these things are great and important. But one of the other Digital Eclipse collections, well, in the, the SNK collection, something that I didn't find out until I watched these uh, GDC panels was they have something within those games because one of the difficulties is the Mega Man games, those came out on the NES, the Famicom. They had instruction manuals. You could sit and play. I had a notebook full of passwords that I that I found and copied down in grids, and I wish I still had it because that's such a dumb artifact. <laughs> but arcade games didn't have that. You could maybe take some notes. You could maybe trade between people, but you had the span of your credit yeah. to figure it out. And if it was a popular game, there's a line behind you. So get good. But... If you take the game out of the original context of the arcade cabinet, you still want to preserve it. You still want to be able to play it. But there's idiosyncrasies of how you control it. You can't twist the joystick in quite the same way. You don't have a dance pad. You don't have whatever it is. So how do you translate that? As well as how do you get people to understand the game and get the context of it? Something they have in the SNK collection is essentially player piano style playthroughs of the games. Interesting. Anybody who has ever watched a tool assisted speed run or live TAS runs like TASBOT at the Games Done Quick events and other uh, speed run events, it is essentially a running input list like start game, start uh, the file of the playthrough. And so it just puts in those inputs and it plays the game. It's not a video. It's actually playing through the game. And that can be difficult with something like TaskBot if something gets desynced, but because this is all within the, the code of the SMK collection, it does it. The joy of this is it's super easy to rewind, fast forward. Yeah, just like a, a movie, whatever. But because it's actually starting the game and just auto playing it, you at any time can go tag in. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And you will start playing from that moment, from that point. It's a great way to get to a point to practice somewhere, mm -hmm. to try something over and over. Because, you know, the argument of safe states and does it ruin the challenge or whatever, who cares? Emulation has existed for a while. However, in the light or in the shadow, safe states have existed. If we want to argue high scores and things, yes, let's argue about safe states. Let's argue about uh, the, the changes from the original. But if we're just talking about sharing games, enjoying games... Having those are a great way to do it. I remember years ago having a conversation with an at the time 11 year old who was born well after the NES, but he had a Wii and he had Ninja Gaiden. And he wanted to show me how far he'd gotten into the game. And he's like, yeah, I, I use save saves, but no, I, like, I only save at the beginning because he was at the final boss, yeah. which is a three stage boss that is stupidly hard yeah it doesn't need to be this hard but it is and here we are and so if i were to get a re-release of these things I, i'd want to I, yeah give me safe states who cares and he was just like no no but i really did and i really got them I'm like no i believe that's fine and this is good and this is important because you weren't alive for this you don't have context for ninja gaiden and you're still loving this game these are the reasons why these things should be preserved and put forward and yeah, this murkies those waters of what is the the true version. You know, that that's one that was a very cinematic game, and yet it had localization in order to do that. Right. And so there, there's even localizations that have not been popular, between, not even with the, with the public, but with the developers. Uh, Jeremy Blaustein, who did the localization for Castlevania Symphony of the Night, who is responsible for What is a Man, yeah. As well as the original Metal Gear Solid. He is responsible for so many idiosyncrasies of how characters speak in the Metal Gear franchise for an American audience, for an English speaking audience, that apparently Kojima did not like the changes he made. He at first did and then found out about all the changes and was very unhappy. And thus Jeremy Blaustein only localized the first Metal Gear Solid. Do we change this so that we get something more akin to Kojima's vision 
or do we work with what we have from Metal Gear Solid, which I think was a very solid localization. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, going back to the safe state thing, like I've been a Castlevania fan for a long time. I never got anywhere near the final boss in the first Castlevania game because it's freaking hard. Mm -hmm. But with save states in the recent collection they released on the Switch, I got further than I ever got before by save scumming in a way that I couldn't before. You know, same in Super Castlevania. And I appreciate that kind of assistant. Yes, if someone's trying to prove that they're skilled at this thing, great. But that's not why I'm playing games. I rarely play games for the skill of it. Recently, if you've been following me on Twitter, I just recently beat Horizon Zero Dawn, which was a fantastic game, but I hated the combat from toe to tip. I wasn't good at it. It's about stealth and reaction times, two of my worst worst skills in games. And so I put it on story mode, which pretty much gave me a ton of health and made the enemies incredibly weak. And yes, does it make some of the fights anticlimactic? Sure. But I'm not playing Horizon Zero Dawn for the combat. Some people might be, but I'm not. I played it for the story of Aloy and this character and this world, which I loved and made me very excited for the sequel coming out in February. So like, I think the same with emulation and with games. Like, I want to play these games again. I don't mind save state, and I think it helps. And I mean, Nintendo is getting in on the act. All of the stuff on Switch Online now has save state, now has rewind, now has all of these features that emulation's been doing for ages that Nintendo was against. In fact, they're releasing on the Nintendo, and I think on the Super Nintendo, but definitely on the Nintendo, enhanced versions of these games, special editions. Yes, they have. And some of them have multiple ones. Right. And like they're just like, there's a special edition of Metroid where you start at the end of the game with all of the weapons ready to fight Mother Brain so you can just see the ending. This is the kind of stuff that people who make emulated games and have been doing emulation have been doing for years. Yeah. And now it's bec like even Nintendo's doing it. And of course, giving no credit to the original people who are doing it because there are multiple ways to do it. That's the point of emulation is to kind of make it your own. I mean, think about Christian Whitehead. Christian Whitehead is where he is with Sonic Team and making brand new Sonic games because he emulated old games and then helped to rework the ports for mobile and for other consoles. And then he made Sonic Mania. Sonic Mania was an original game based on previous Sonic games, I know. But like... An original game because he emulated old games. You know, I think that at the end of the day, yes, if you want to play the pure version, sure, if you still have a Dreamcast or Game Boy Advanced or a Nintendo, but not everybody does. So we should make, there should be ways to play these things that, like, one of the reasons I love Steam, even though I worry about losing these digital copies of games, is because I can play real, some really old games on there as they were, their PC versions at least for the most part. And like, it's why the some of the pixel remasters annoy me because they could do so much with them mm -hmm. and they're not. It's why it an annoys me that Chrono Trigger is altered. Also, like, I feel like when you emulate a game, you want to make it better. Like, it's a minor improvement, but on the Switch version of Final Fantasy VII, the backgrounds are so crisp that you can see items in the world so easily because they shine. But they it's the prettiest this game has ever looked, polygons and all. Well, it's very funny because I think it was Final Fantasy IX in particular was one where when they went back to remaster it, they realized that all of those pre-rendered backgrounds that is so so iconic of the PS1 Final Fantasy games, they were HD images. They were like really well-detailed images that they then had to shrink and compress. And so when it came time to put it on an HD system, they went, oh, well, we have the originals. And so the backgrounds look so much better and people have, have made incredible from my vantage point, mind-boggling goddamn fairy tale magic mods to Steam versions of Final Fantasy games. Final Fantasy VII running through an AI upscaler and the backgrounds look incredible. This wasn't what that was. They just had the originals and could just put that on there. Yeah. It's it's insane. And also, uh, I don't want to let Sonic get too far in the rear view before mentioning a few other like little points that have also that I've noticed over uh, time. One is I found out some nuts and bolts about Sonic Jam, the Sega Saturn collection of the Sega Genesis Sonic games. One, two, three, and Knuckles. They programmed it in the Saturn's architecture. They didn't just slap it on an emulator, which wouldn't be bad, but it did mean that they were able to do all of the lock-on stuff without it being super fiddly or fidgety. And it also meant that they were able to put in difficulty settings. Now with 
the way that hex editors and emulation is, you can still do that, but this was how they did it at Sega at the time. So you had original mode and then normal mode, which actually was saner than than Sega. And uh, Christian Whitehead's version of Sonic 2, the iOS port that he made or spearheaded, was very it was a very big deal because it brought back the hidden palace zone yeah which was one of those dummied out things that everybody knew about because of uh because of diving through data and because of the level select and everything else it's like what is the hidden palace zone i want to go to the hidden palace zone. what's it going to be and we built it up in our heads for decades over how great it would be and it's a good zone it's great but I also want to put this out into the world because it occurred to me, and uh, you all must suffer with me, wanting these things and getting these things is tantamount to the Star Wars Trilogy Special Edition, where we are getting, you know, the original director vision. Is it the original director vision? We're adding in all these things, stuff that we couldn't do before. It could be good. It could be bad. It could be the Yuzum in Return of the Jedi. You know, these are just... uh, it's not, it's not good, bad, or indifferent, but I do want this to be said. Yeah, I mean, I think that ultimately I'm in favor of these kinds of changes. I think that I'm of two minds about it, right? Like, if there were an archive of original NES, Super NES, Sega Genesis, whatever else games that I could just dive into untouched, great. Then remaster and remake them to hell because we can access the originals. I think my biggest problem is that There is no Library of Congress for video games. Right. There are video games in the Library of Congress, which is a different story. But, like, I think that I don't understand why Nintendo and PlayStation... Well, PlayStation's sort of done it, right? Like, PlayStation Now is essentially that for PlayStation games. But it's not every game. It's a lot of games. But you can buy that service and then have access to all of these games from PS1, PS2, and PS3, and even PS4. Nintendo is sort of doing that with the Nintendo Switch Online stuff for Nintendo and Super Nintendo. And now they've announced they're doing N64 and Sega Genesis, which is kind of weird because... But they were kind of doing that ever since the Wii. They still had, you know, TurboGrafx-16 and Sega Genesis. Right. It's muddied waters, you're right. And like, but also there's a Sega Genesis collection that I paid for on the Switch. That now I'm getting a lot of those games. Also, why are we constantly re-releasing Sonic 2? Sonic 3 and Knuckles is the superior game, and it's never released anywhere. It's never in the collections, and I don't understand why. I remember reading some reasoning behind it, and it was logical, if not great. And I, I don't remember it, unfortunately. But this also, Sega Genesis is a system, is a library that has been dutifully yeah re-released we've been able to play a plethora of sega genesis titles on modern hardware since the ps2 era yeah and we've gotten a sega genesis mini console i think we've gotten two different ones and the the more recent one gave us mega man the wily wars in america for the first time in a way that wasn't importing or buying a, a repro cartridge but the thing is as voluminous as those collections have become nearly 50 games in some cases or more sega genesis had a lot more than 50 games and yeah sonic's on every one of those collections so is usually vector man and uh maybe comic zone wrist star i don't know dynamite heady era star heroes gunstar heroes you know beyond oasis land stalker gain ground any of these games any of the fantasy stars I know these because I have looked at these lists a lot. <laughs> and you start to you start to have that thing of like, well, do I get this collection or this collection? Do I do I need to you know, I got the most recent Sega Genesis collection, then they announced the mini console, and I've only got so many outlets in my apartment. <laughs> I have a lot of consoles and this is the life I've chosen for myself. But it's like, do I need to spend the the full price tag for essentially Wily Wars? plus a few extra games that might not be on that collection. And that's still neglecting hundreds of games that'll get lost by the wayside or could get lost by the wayside. And this is where I'm very much with the Video Game History Foundation, which is the organization that Frank Spaldi is a part of. I I now have double checked that. I need to get these things correct. Look, and, eventually, as long as we get them right by the end of the episode, it's fine. Exactly, you know, and then we can go. And then, then I can edit it. But I'm not editing this part. This is, this is important. It's all staying in. Th- this is important. No this, this is our original vision. You know, even podcast episodes. But, and, and that that's where these things get absolutely ridiculous. But the argument for emulation is, yeah, those 
those preservations where even when things are being preserved and larger companies are playing ball, there's weird nebulousness of who holds the copyright and is this okay? And if nobody's making money off of this at any point or plans to make money on it, it's the kind of thing where the Mother 3 translation project, the localization project, I, if I'm not mistaken, they were very upfront about the fact that during the long process of doing this, if at any point Nintendo went, hey, we're releasing Mother 3 in America, they would have closed up shop within yep. 15 minutes. Yep. Like that, they were doing this only because Nintendo wouldn't do it. Yeah. And Mother 3 is something that people are still talking about 20 years later. Yeah. But there's plenty of other games that don't have as vocal of a fan base or as bright of a light shining on them that people are going to miss or going to lose. But if we try to emulate them, we're, we're stepping on the money that they're not attempting to make. But th- this is getting into more of, a, of an argument for, for emulation and preservation. But I guess that is, at the end of the day, linked to the idea of what is the true version or what is saved or thrown away when we have new versions brought to us, when companies do choose to put them into modern hands, which I think should be done. Yeah, I mean, I I think when it comes down to it, and I, to bring it back to this idea of re-releasing, I think that as someone who very recently tried to get his hands on a Game Boy Advanced SP, which I've mentioned several times, the markup on it was so high in most used and indie game stores that like I couldn't find one that I wanted to spend $400 on. But like being able to get one at a reasonable price, then I was like, all right, let me buy some of my games that I regret selling. Again, the markup is so high. The markup on these things go down as they become less rare. And like as much as I would love to own Metroid Fusion, one of the best games ever made in a physical form, for now, I'm happy to be able to play a version of it on my EverDrive in my SP, which is as close to the authentic experience as I can get without, you know, spending hundreds of dollars. And not everyone has that kind of money. But I think as we remaster stuff, that the value of that stuff goes down because now they're more accessible. And take or leave the market and the collection scene as it will, I think that making these things accessible to people is the most important thing. And while... I draw the line at emulation when you're emulating current gen stuff. And there have been times that that's happened, especially on the 3DS, where people were emulating current gen stuff and people have to work harder to block that out. And I get it. People don't have money. They want to play these games and they're doing what they can. But I think nobody is making money off of Metroid Fusion anymore except indie sellers and it's all profit or GameStop when they were reselling games. Like, I don't think emulation of a game that Nintendo refuses to sell to me again is hurting it. And... If they put Metroid Fusion on Switch for 20 bucks tomorrow, which is an outrageous price for that game, I think at this point, I think 10 bucks is fine, I would still pay it because I want to have it through the official channels. I want to spend that money. But if I can't, I still want to play it. And I want to play it again because there's a brand new Metroid game coming out. By the time this airs, it, it'll probably already be out. Like, I think that I get mostly frustrated when people nitpick these remasters when there's no other way to play it. Like, sure. The DX version of Sonic Adventure is not the original version, but it's the best version. And right now it's one of the only versions you can play. And I think that's okay. I think that video games are deeply personal to people, especially certain games. And I think like there were folks when the Mass Effect Legendary Edition came out were complaining about some of the changes. Meanwhile, there are other things like there was a change in Mass Effect 1 that I'm so thankful for. There is a enemy that you encountered on one of the side missions who's a Turian due to a graphical glitch or other issues showed up humanoid. They turned him into a Turian. He's like on a, uh, you know, it's a digital version of him as you're talking to him as a call. It's like a video version of him. They changed it in the legendary edition. So he looks like he was supposed to, they made that fix yet. However, Conrad Werner, who, you can uh, talk off a ledge or encourage to be an asshole. In the second game, no matter what, he treats you like you put a gun in his face. They didn't change that because in the third game, they corrected and he, if you made that choice to not put a gun in his face in the first game, and then he still says it in the second game, if you stick to that story, in the third game, he apologizes about lying about you putting a gun in his face. He was really upset. And like, so that through line wasn't worth fixing because they corrected it in the games as they were coming out. I think that kind of stuff is always awesome. Being able to put things in that you couldn't put in the original version 
especially if you're the one remaking it, Bioware is still re-releasing it, and arguably not everyone who worked on those original games are still there. It's a whole other bag of worms. And even if they are, they're different people now. Right. But I think actively going, we couldn't do this, but now we can, so we're going to, is a pretty cool thing to see, especially in the age of patches and fixes and updates. Yeah, and even in the days of cartridges only, there were revisions within the cartridges. You want to go down a weird rabbit hole, Berenstein Bears, alternate world kind of thing. Yeah, look at how the small changes made from a revision of a cartridge from one to the next, what bit of a menu shows up, and... These changes happen. However you first experience a game is going to be the truest version to you. But those things are going to shift and they're going to be different from how somebody else played it the first time. And it's a thing of, yes, there are certain things that can be changed, should be changed. But for the most part, it's all it's all correct. Yeah. I mean, I own a Chrono Trigger Super Nintendo cartridge. Thank you, Frankie Bradley Lestrange. I'm very thankful for that. And I love it. Do I have any desire to play it on a Super Nintendo? If I could get one, maybe. But I would say, as a Chrono Trigger fan, and this may be blasphemous, the DS version is the definitive version. It runs better than the PlayStation version, which is what it is ported from. The cutscenes take less time to load. They look great and are all done by Akira Toriyama in the original style of what the manuals and stuff were drawn as and the strategy guides. Like, I love the Super Nintendo version. It's the version that got me into the game. But the DS version is easily the definitive version and the best way to play that game. If Yeah, if you'd only ever played it on the Super Nintendo, you wouldn't be like, oh, this is lacking anything. But you play any turn-based RPG on the Nintendo DS and you just go, why why don't more RPGs, why don't more turn-based RPGs have touch screens? This is incredible. Well, sure. It's like when I played the Samus Returns remake on the 3DS to get amped up for Dread. The map was on the bottom screen the whole time. And I was like, wow, it's going to suck to play literally any Metroid game after this. Because that's such a, like, obvious quality of life thing that you can only do when you have two screens. And now things are fast enough where if you want to, like, hit select to bring up the map, it's not as much of a thing as, you know, having to... Bringing up the map in Super Metroid, it's a cartridge. It doesn't take that long to load. But after a while, it starts to wear on you. Yeah. But being able to just hit the you know the minus button the select button however you want to look at it and it pops up as an overlay pauses the game a la symphony of the night let's say yeah that's fine we can make that work we can do these things the the world ends with you was a nintendo ds classic that was ported to the switch that had a great deal of difficulty that i'm not going to get into in terms of from touch screen to a system that has a touch screen but is also single screen and so it's and in the same way that the the SNK Arcade Collection, there's some difficulties you run into because of the technical aspects. There's new technical problems, not just the old ones that we're, we were talking about at the beginning. Like, oh, now we can now we can fix uh, now we can make that guy a Torian. Now the the armored armadillo stage won't lag at the very end of it if you don't shoot down everything. The I mean, uh, Symphony of the Night having the the life max up uh, appear after you defeat a boss. The first time I saw someone play it on the Xbox 360 and the game didn't slow down to a crawl was jarring to say the least. And so all of these things are, are part of this ongoing idea of, of how, how do we preserve these games? Cause we should, and we shall, and we must, but how? Yeah. I think that an archival way to preserve these games is what is necessary. I think at, at a minimum and then beyond that, we can, there's plenty good to do. Yeah. I think that there's nothing wrong with remastering and making changes. Look, I never played the Uncharted series until it got remastered and re-released on the PS4 because I never owned a PS3. And I loved all three Uncharted games, though. I will still say that Uncharted 4 is the best of them. Be that as it may, I think like, you know, on the other hand, people are sick of them re-releasing with Skyrim and Grand Theft Auto V on every damn console. Yeah, and I'm I'm a collector. I'm a physical collector, and I'm one of those people where if I have an easy way to play the game, I will go about it. But if I can get the, the older version, the complete version, I'm not one that necessarily needs all of the pieces. But on the flip side of things, can there please, please be an easy, legal, U.S. way to play Snatcher? <laughs> <laughs> right? That I mean, that game went through so many iterations from console to console, and it's fascinating to watch. So I don't know what version we're going to... Give me the Sega CD version. That's the one that came out in America. Fine. Give me the authentically American experience of it. But 
I, I'd like to check it out. I'd, I'd love to, you know, Konami is getting into the swing of releasing its old stuff. Great. Yeah. Can we play it? Can, can I play it, please? Yeah, I mean, we've done many episodes of SideQuest. We had one on Snatcher by the incredibly insane Ian. Like, he, when he was talking about how to play it, he was like, I don't know, get a Sega Saturn, I guess. Like, there's no easy way to play it. Right. And, like, the, I've learned that over the the now more than a year of producing SideQuest is some games, super easy. You can just pull it up, play it, you know, find it online. And then other games, especially from the PS2, PS3 era, it's like, where do I find this game? How do I play it? Like, Thankful, thankful for me, a lot of old Xbox games are now on PC or or the console on the because they have been Xbox has been phenomenal about backwards compatibility. But then other consoles have not been like Nintendo famously not really at all being backwards compatible. Like I'm lucky that I can play DS and 3DS games on my 3DS like that's as far as backwards. And now that I have a Game Boy Advance SP, I can if I have old Game Boy games, I can play them again, Mm -hmm. which is actually really exciting for me. Like. I haven't played Pokemon Yellow in a while. My nephew has had my copy of it because he found it in my father's car. And he's like, can I have this? He's going <laughs> to lend it back to me so I can play it again, which is actually really awesome. Like, I mean, part of the problem is also just it's the reason I made side quests, right? This idea that people are too too uh, negative about games and too much like it has to be this way. When there's really no right answer. This If this show is pontificated anything is that we don't really know that much and that at the end of the day it's a conversation right there's the idea that i don't think remasters and remakes are inherently bad or inherently good but when you're remaking and remastering things and taking out the things that made them what they were like you've taken out some of the soul of the game that's a problem if you're remaking a game that only came out a year ago or two years ago or whatever it was like the fact that they're remaking the last of us one for the ps5 seems stupid i get that it was a ps3 game but it came out at the end of the ps3 game and they made a remaster for the ps4 and now they're going to re-re-release it on the ps5 that doesn't make sense why yeah if you're, if you're still able to access it within that environment that does feel a little excessive right but that said someone may not have had either of the other two versions and want to buy it so oh but the ps4 remaster version works on the ps5 i played it recently I have the digital version. Like, that's the part that kind of, that's when we're in the, but on the other hand, remaking Knights of the Old Republic, one of the best Star Wars games ever made, is really exciting because I know people who tried to play the original version and it has not aged well. It's not a bad game by any means, but I think a remake is really exciting because it'll give this really incredible Star Wars story that has nothing to do with the Skywalkers. Thank God. I love the Skywalkers. Mark Hamill, you're great, but like, more stories without them. But KOTOR is also early Bioware. Yeah. And, you know, you, a, a big Mass Effect fan, and many other Mass Effect and Dragon Age fans can get their Star Wars and early Bioware on at the same time. And I think that's a great thing. It's, it, you're right. Knights of the Old Republic is a great game. And Knights of the Old Republic 2 is also fun. Yeah. I mean, and but it's the same with, like, the remakes of Resident Evil 2 and 3. The remake of Resident Evil 1 on the GameCube is considered to be the definitive version and is the version they use for the PC version of Resident Evil mm-hmm. 1. I've heard great things about the Resident Evil 2 and 3 remakes nitpicks aside like but now they're talking about remaking resident evil 4 which i loved and is one of my favorite games in the franchise because it's less scary and has more action that's a ps2 game a gamecube game and like it looks good it doesn't look great but it looks good why are we remaking that one that one's pretty recent like i think that one is actually one of the only ones that's not in the current engine yeah so in terms of release and things like that it, it's more to bring it in line with that and it's just it's it's interesting to me like what the, they're remaking dead space a game i only played very recently and loved and i'm excited they're remaking but i played the original dead space on pc last year it's still a good game and i don't i didn't i never there was never a moment when i was playing it and going this could use a remake. It's not good. No, I had a blast. It was a great game. Like, I don't, so, like, I think those lines are where we struggle with changes and up, updates. It's like, and look, I saw the dev update on the the Dead Space remake. It looks gorgeous. But, you know, I think the priorities of what we're remaking, what we're remastering, and why we're changing things still aren't completely in line. There isn't a right or wrong answer, but I think there are things that help preserve games and that there are things that are not and i think what's interesting is like removing glitches and and making things a more smoother play experience 
I feel ultimately are helping the game experience, but removing whole bosses or stages to streamline something, you know, is a detriment. Like, it's unclear why some of those decisions are being made in gaming. Right. And especially because sometimes it's a, uh, you know, they, they don't have the source code anymore, which is a great argument for why we need to get on this shit yesterday. Yeah. The reason the F- Final Fantasy VIII uh, remaster took so long is because they didn't have the source code, as I remember. They yeah, there's something to- about they couldn't find the gold disc and they were able to make something work. But And so, like, that's really fascinating to me, too. Yeah, I think there has to be a better way to preserve gaming and preserve the experiences of gaming. Like, sure, the SNK arcade collection, I'm sure, is great, but it's not going to be the same as playing the arcade cabinet. Like, it's impossible to recreate that without an arcade cabinet at home. You know, And I, th- but I think going the lengths to try and recreate those experiences are still important. I agree. There's more to this topic. I think we've gone a little left and a little right. I would like to revisit this discussion of like why the Polygon generation aged so badly. I think there are, are other spinoff conversations about why emulation is important, but also why it can be detrimental. You know, piracy is bad. Of course, you're taking money out of these indie. Like if you're pirating an indie devs game, you suck because indie devs barely get enough as it is. You should play that game. Yeah, I don't know. It's complicated. And I think that it's going to be important to continue this discussion, as we will. Um, But tell us what you think. What do you think of emulation? What do you think about the preservation of games? And should things be improved as they are re-released? Or should they be kept to their original version? You know, I think both are right for different reasons. And like, where do you stand? Let us know somewhere on the internet, like, why you think we should or shouldn't make those kinds of changes. Yeah, what are the crucial changes that you think a game needs to have? What are specific games where you went, they changed this, now it sucks, or they changed it, and now I can finally play it? Because I think at its best, remasters, re-releases, or just emulation collections are about accessibility to games that people should know about one way or the other, whether it's one person or the entire population. And uh, what are the games that have been re-released yet or have no legal means nowadays to be played that you think people should play? Because there's a lot of great stuff out there. We don't know all of them. That's why side quests exist, to share in all of these sorts of games. And so let us know about these games, about your feelings on these through all the different ways that we have this conversation on Twitter, Gmail, most social media, fun and games pod. You can go to certainpov.com and find a permanent invite link to our Discord where there's a lot of other fantastic shows on the Certain POV Network covering a whole gauntlet of, of pop culture and the like. And we talk about gaming there. We talk about these episodes. We talk about the games that we've beaten and news that we're excited about or things that we just need to vent about every now and then. Yeah. And also, of course, if you have a moment, rate and review us on your podcast platform of choice. A five-star review helps us get seen by more incredible listeners like you. Tell a friend about the podcast. If you know someone who loves gaming, Maybe they love Yuri Lowenthal, previous guest Yuri Lowenthal. Uh, Tell them that we've done two episodes with him and get them to subscribe. But in all seriousness, like, thank you for listening and and thank you for being a part of this conversation. Please connect with us wherever you can because we want to keep it going and continue to grow this community. I love that people come on our Discord now to put their gaming accomplishments, things that have just been fun for me to get through this goddamn pandemic that seems like it'll never end. Yeah, all all those little accomplishments that we have, they're fantastic. And we never really have have definitive conclusions in these episodes and that may feel a little odd but it's because these things are ongoing and we want you to be a part of this conversation it is a conversation thank you for being a part of it i'm jeff monan and i'm matt aka stormageddon and happy gaming Are you tired of watching your beloved characters being tortured by careless authors? Are you sick of feeling like they could have swapped out all of the painful action and the plot would remain untouched? Subscribe to Books That Burn, a fortnightly book review podcast focusing on fictional depictions of trauma. We assume that the characters' reactions are reasonable and focus on how badly or well they were served by their authors. Join us for our minor character spotlights, main character discussions, and favorite non-traumatic things in the dark books we love. Find us on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. CPOV. CertainPOV.com.